So in 6.1 and 6.2, it's actually both sections in your book, uh, we deal with proportion data again. So maybe you remember that from 4.5 when the data itself is a bunch of yeses and nos. So binary categorical data as opposed to something that we can take the mean of, not something that we can average. Uh, but what's different from when we saw this in 4.5 is now we have two different proportions. So for example, maybe I have a random sample of 200 millennials and some number of them, 140 in this case, do something, own an iPhone, I guess, in this example. And then a random sample of 150 of some other group, baby boomers, and 100 of them own an iPhone. So the point is, like when you saw this in 4.5, I have a sample size. Maybe I can even label these things. And then some number of them that fit a given criteria. Except now, instead of just having one sample that I calculate this proportion for, I have two. So in the past, I called the sample size N. Maybe now I'll call one of them N1 and one of them N2. And in the past, X is what I use to refer to the number out of my sample that have the given criteria. Uh, maybe I'll use X1 and X2 for that. And in the past, sometimes I could tell you the number of people that own millennials that own an iPhone or the percentage of millennials that own an iPhone and you wanna be able to go back and forth. So you might be told, what would it be, 70% of millennials on an iPhone? In which case, you would have to figure out that 70% means 140 out of the 200. So you might be told 70% of millennials on an iPhone, um, then you calculate X. Or I guess it's X1 in my notation. And the way you would do that is you would say, well, 70% is 0.7 of means multiply 200 is 140. So anyways, be careful of that. Sometimes you're told X, sometimes you're told, I guess you'd call this P hat. Um, we might call this P hat one, the sample proportion for the first group. Anyways, with all this information, you can do the same things we've been doing. All right, I could ask you to do hypothesis testing or ask you to make a confidence interval. What I'll do in this video is we'll do hypothesis testing. And what I'll do in the next video is a confidence interval example. And you'll see that they're pretty similar to what we've been doing in the past. Just a little bit of new notation to learn. And then you're good to go. So I guess without further ado, maybe I'll say, can I conclude with, uh, I don't know, 90%. Why not? Certainty. that the proportion of all millennials who own an iPhone is different than the proportion of all baby boomers who own an iPhone. And when I ask you this question, uh, what you're really looking for are kind of the same key things that we looked for before. This different than will be really important when we state our null and alternative hypotheses, and you wanna be able to pull out all this information from the problem. So I guess we can just start going through it. The first step, I'm gonna ask you to state the Nolan alternative hypothesis for what it's worth. This will be the last time we do hypothesis testing in this class is in this section. Uh, the null hypothesis back when we were in 4.5 compared P and P naught. But if you remember what we did in 5.3 when we had two sample independent data, we compared the mu's of the two different groups. What we do in 6.1 and 6.2 is kind of a cross of those two things. Instead of using mu's, we're gonna use p's, but it's th there is no p not to compare this to. We'll have the p's of the two different groups. So maybe the p of the millennials and the p of the baby boomers. And those will be the two things that I compare. So I think this is pretty similar to what we did with two sample independent data, except we're changing the p's into, or changing the mu's into p's. The null hypothesis all throughout this class, we've always put an equal sign between the two things that we're comparing. Still true. For the alternative hypothesis, because it says different than, we can put a does not equal sign in here. If it said, can I conclude that millennials are more likely or the proportion of all millennials who own a foreign iPhone is greater than the percentage of all baby boomers who own one, then I could put a greater than sign in here. Anyways, this is a two-tailed test. That's all you gotta do for step one. For step two, you could state the shape, the center, and the spread of the distribution. However, I don't need you to do all that. The shape's approximately normal for a pretty complicated formulaic reason. The spread, the center and the spread are also given by pretty ugly looking formulas. We're gonna skip 
shape, center, and spread again. So that brings us right to step three, where we draw the picture. When you draw in the picture, you draw something that's approximately normal, as you would have seen if you did step two. Uh, we've been putting zero in the middle for all of our hypothesis testing. Conveniently, we're still going to do that. Uh, we'll only do the p-value method, although really, it turns out that anytime you're dealing with proportions, you're back to a z distribution, not a t distribution. So because we're using a z distribution, we could use inverse norm if we needed to find a critical value. What I'm saying is, in theory, you could do the classical method of hypothesis testing here. But I'll never ask you to do that. I'm only going to ask you to do the p-value method, the more expert level way of doing these, because at this point, you're kind of experts with this stuff. What you want to do is hit the stat key and go over to tests. And then you're looking for a new calculator function. The calculator function you want will end in the word test because it's hypothesis testing. But we need one that deals with two different proportions. The one that kind of fits the bill here is this sixth thing, two prop z test. Two prop because we have two different proportions. And with proportions, it's always a z test. If you hit enter here, you'll see that it doesn't ask you for a whole lot of stuff because there isn't that much information given to you in these problems. N1, X1, N2, and X2. So X1, if I call my ones the millennials, then that would be 140. And N1 would be 200. And if the twos are the baby boomers, then X2 would be 100 and N2 would be 150. For whatever it's worth, common mistake here is to switch up the X's and the N's. A lot of people want to put the 200 first and the 140 second. If your value of X is bigger than your value of N, your calculator will give you an error. It's like, what do you mean 200 out of my 140 people? That doesn't make any sense. Another thing that'll give you an error is if you try putting in 0 0.70 in here for X, note that it does not want the sample proportion. It wants the number in the sample that have the given criteria. Anyways, then it asks you for the alternative hypothesis. Again, the ones are the millennials. My alternative hypothesis was that P1 does not equal P2. So I'll choose this does not equal sign. And then I'll go over here to draw and see what answer it spits out. So there it is. Calculating my test statistic, it's 0 0.6648. So I'm gonna put that over to the right of zero and I'll indicate it with a Z, 0 0.6648. And then I'm going to shade to the right of this point. But because it's a two-tailed test, I also want to shade to the left of the negative of this point. So negative 0 0.6648. Note that I don't denote this one with a Z because this one was not my test statistic. It was just the opposite of my test statistic. But it makes its way into the picture to show where the p-value shows up. p-value is pretty big. p-value is over 50%, 50.62%. And you might be like, wait, I thought you told me when the p-value was over 50%, that means I did something wrong and I need to change my null and alternative hypotheses. Uh, no, that's only if it's a one-tailed test, not if it's a two-tailed test. My p-value is 50%. And then step four, which I guess is really step three because you're skipping step two, is to state your conclusion. And good news, conclusion is the same as it's been. Why are you doing what you're doing? Because the p-value is greater than alpha. Did I even stay alpha here? Yeah, alpha was 10%. p-value is 50%. So because my p-value is greater than alpha, there is sufficient, no, there is not. If the p-value is greater than alpha, there is not sufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. And if you can't reject the null hypothesis, you can't say the claim is true. So I cannot conclude that whatever my claim was, uh, the proportion of all baby boomers that own an iPhone is different than the portion of all millennials. Kind of a lot to write, but really I'm just restating my claim down here, saying that I cannot conclude and then whatever my claim is. Uh, so that's hypothesis testing when you have two different proportions. I think I'm just going to do the one example because I think what you'll see is really they all kind of look like this. All right? What can change? Once it's different than, I could say less than or greater than. But that just makes it a one-tailed test, either left or right-tailed as opposed to two-tailed. You're still doing the same thing. Your null and alternative will look just like this. You just might change this sign. You'll skip shape, center, and spread. You'll figure out your p-value and compare it to alpha. If your p-value is greater than alpha, can't reject the null, can't say the claim is true. If p-value is less than alpha, reject the null, say the claim is true. And that's it. That's all you're doing with hypothesis testing when you have two different proportions.